Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our webinar, Black Robes and White Coats Using Project ECHO to Increase Judiciary Knowledge About Substance Use Disorder. Today's webinar is presented by SAMHSA's Game Center with the support of SAMHSA, which is the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. Our presenters today are Michelle Cern, Judge Jack Durkin, and Dr. Joyce Chocfler, and I'll introduce them shortly. First, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Dr. Melissa Stein. I go by pronouns she, her, and I'm a senior research associate at FAMSA's Game Center. And before we start our presentations, I would like to uh, just review some introductory items. First, the views, opinions, and content expressed in this presentation and discussion do not necessarily reflect the views, opinions, or policies of the Center for Mental Health Services, the Center for Substance Abuse Treatment, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, or the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. If you have any questions in regards to the technology or for our presenters, please type them in the uh, Q&A pod found at the bottom of your screen. At the conclusion of the presentations, we will address as many questions as we are able. We'll also be conducting a couple of polls throughout the event and appreciate your participation. When you see a poll pop up, simply select and submit your response. And you should have just seen a poll pop up now, so we really appreciate your participation. Today's webinar is being recorded and slides will be disseminated via the games listserv following this event. We'll also notify you when the recording is posted to SAMHSA's YouTube channel. A certificate of attendance will be available for download at the end of today's webinar. Please note that this certificate is for your personal portfolio. We're not able to offer CEU credits. We do have ASL interpretation for today's event. Our interpreters are Linda Eggie and Kip Oberman. We also have live captioning. Uh, to view live captioning, click live transcript CC at the bottom of the, the screen and select show subtitles. And now I'd like to briefly introduce our speakers. Michelle Cern is a principal court management consultant for the National Center of State Courts. She's been with NCSC for five years. Her portfolio consists of, diverse set of a diverse set of state and local projects in the areas of treatment court, pretrial, probation, and justice system collaboration. Prior to working with NCSC, Ms. Cern was a state treatment court coordinator for both Minnesota Judicial Branch and Wisconsin Supreme Court, where she developed statewide treatment court policies and procedures, provided training and technical assistance, and worked across state agencies to support treatment courts. The Honorable Jack Durkin is a judge for the General Division of Mahoney County Court of Common Pleas in Ohio. He was initially elected to the bench in 1997. And judge Durkin presides over the Mahoney County Felony Drug Court after playing a key role in creating the program in 1998. He's also active in state level efforts to address substance misuse involving opioids and other drugs. He represents the state of Ohio on the Regional Judicial Opioid Initiative Leadership Team. Judge Durkin is a member of the Ohio State Bar Association, the Mahoney County Bar Association, the Ohio Common Plea Judges Association. He chairs the Ohio Judicial Conference and is an Ohio Judicial College trustee. Dr. Joyce Chocfler is a physician duly board certified in family medicine and addiction medicine. She currently serves as program director of the fellowship in addiction medicine at East Tennessee State University. Dr. Chocfler brings a deep understanding of rural issues. She grew up in rural central Appalachia and gained the majority of her clinical addiction treatment experience in a rural community in southwestern New Mexico. So you know who is presenting with us today, and now I'd like to take a look at our poll results and see who all is joining us for our presentations today. So we're seeing a majority of you joining us from urban locations, followed by rural, and then uh, about 20% of you coming in from suburban, sub suburban 
areas. And we have a few of you coming up, joining us from tribal lands, welcome. And then we've got a number of folks joining us from community-based provider organizations, um, several folks calling in from government policy organizations. Also seeing a few representing academia corrections. And then finally, a few of you are joining us from the judiciary as well as public health. So thank you so much to all of you for joining us today. And without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Michelle Stern to begin our presentation. Good afternoon. Thank you so much, Melissa. Thank you all for joining us today. I'm gonna to start off our presentation and then we'll hand off to Judge Durkin and Dr. Troxler as appropriate. So I wanna start by talking about the Project DECO model and um, giving a little bit of background about that and then we'll go into how we adapted it for use across um, the, with the judiciary. So Project ECHO is originally a medical model um, standing for Extension for Community Healthcare Outcomes. Um, what it does, the ECHO model does, and we'll have a video on a couple slides, is it's a learning platform that was created by the University of New Mexico for doctor to doctor learning in the medical community which provided for an expert panel to come together and create learning loops to exchange information. So the one-to-many sort of distribution of information and sharing of ideas. It was focused on a topic and encouraged case-based learning. So it was face-to-face -face and when developed prior to this era of um, pandemic learning and working, um, it, it, it used Zoom and video conferencing technology to bring folks together from far away so that they would have access to medical information and expertise that perhaps was not available to them um, in, their, in their locale, in their rural community, whatever it may be. And ECHO worked to build networks between professional disciplines and improve outcomes across those disciplines. So we're gonna do a short video here introducing ECHO from the University of Minnesota, sorry, University of New Mexico. Project ECHO is a performance optimizer. Think of it as a high-speed internet connection. For the healthcare system. It spreads new medical knowledge throughout the healthcare system from university medical centers and other specialty care sites to the front lines of community care. Rather than information flowing in one direction, community providers learn from specialists. They learn from each other, and specialists learn from community providers as new best practices emerge. Under ECHO, community providers use video technology to participate in guided practice with specialist mentors. They acquire new skills that allow them to treat patients they otherwise would have referred out. Patients with complex chronic conditions get high quality care where they live from providers they know. No waiting months to see a specialist. No long drives back and forth to get critical care. ECHO exponentially increases access to specialty care by moving knowledge instead of moving patients. Suffering and pain are reduced and lives are improved and even saved. Project ECHO, changing the world fast. Here we go. So what we did is we took that echo model for the medical community and we adjusted it a little bit for the for the judiciary in that we used medical experts as the hubs and judges across each of the states that we worked in as as the spokes to share information back and forth. And what this slide tells you about is a de good description of the echo movement. So if you a um, lot of information on this slide, but what I wanted to point out is that this is looking at the United States as a whole with data that is through June of this year and looking at the number of hubs. So you see hub countries is one, that's the US. And then just above that sort of on, in the middle of the slide, it talks about serving 353 hubs. So a hub is an organization, um, a hospital, a treatment center, um, a treatment agency that hosts a ECHO series, which we'll, we'll get into more depth about that a little bit, but you can see that just in the United States alone hosted ECHOs, 
touch 177 countries, 75, 12 cities, over 40,000 partners, and over 300,000 unique learners. With an, over 1 million total attendees, over 1.8 million learning hours, um, and looking at those session met metrics, there's an average of 46 learners in each echo session, um, and each session lasts on average 78 minutes. And you can see, you know, the hubs launched per year and the attendances per year, and to see how those have just continued to increase since creation um, in the early aughts, and to having over 419. Um, thousand attendances per year in 2020. And this is a, a report that is available on the ECHO website, which we'll have um, linked to it, I believe, in the materials. We can easily provide that information in chat as well. And you can search by country and look at all these different metrics. One of the other interesting um, metrics on the ECHO website, and that really does show the, the breadth with which um, Project ECHO uh, uh, is throughout the United States is this map here looking at hubs and super hubs. So the pink and the circ pink circles, red dots, um, red diamonds are hubs and super hubs. Um, for our purposes, again, hubs are those, those agencies, organizations that are holding ECHO series. Super hubs are those that have collaborated with the University of New Mexico to be able to do training and some other more um, advanced sort of things to support creation of hubs. But looking at those teal boxes, so that talks about the number of active programs per state. So you can take a glance at this and see, um, you know, which, you know, how active your state is in the Project Echo Hub and Super Hub movement. This next slide, very busy, but really just here again to give an example of the ability uh, of your ability to go onto the, the Project ECHO website and look for programs that are taking place in your area. And that also show, for example, um, you know, the, the scope, the bride's wide scope um, with which there are programs that take place. So you have, um, this is an example looking at um, opioid use disorder echoes and you can see um, searching just by that as a topic, you can see where they're active, um, you know, Pennsylvania, Kansas, Indiana, as of the time of this, this snapshot, but just an, uh, an opportunity for you all as attendees to, to go into search on the, the Project ECHO website and to see what's going on in, in your community, in your state, and with your partners, um, if you're looking for an opportunity to collaborate. This is the place that we started when we were ready to start looking at exploring partners and looking for partnerships uh, within each of the states that we, we piloted this Echo for the Judiciary series. This is how we started, is we, we went to look at, at organizations that were already doing this type of, of work in our communities. And again, this is just a snapshot of a screenshot. So it's not at all inclusive of what's going on. It's not at all inclusive of what's likely happening in these states. It's just a it's just there for example purposes to, to talk about how we got to where we, we landed with these pilots and to show you that the resource is out there. So yes, there's many, many more going on. So how did we alter the Project ECHO model for the judiciary? We took the learning platform, again, primarily used in the medical community. And instead of, instead of having it set up doctor to doctor, we created it to be addiction specialist to judge. So taking those medical experts um, within each state and working to identify some experts and also identify a judicial champion. And so those medical experts and the judicial champion served as the hub team, as, as referred to in the, the ECHO world. And they really were our experts for each series that we, we piloted and that we executed. So again, face, focusing on face-to-face -face recurring um, topics focused on recurring sessions focused on identify topics and that working on case-based learning. So what we did is we we saw it as I mentioned with the map on the previous slide. You know we really look to collaborate with treatment providers, medical schools, wh whomever the the entity was already providing education in the echo space in each state and collaborating with the state judiciary to execute um, and to begin build a relationship uh, between these two professional disciplines that don't always aren't don't always work very very frequently together. 
Um, looking at the why of Project ECHO for the judiciary, we, our joy, the, the Regional Judicial Opioid Initiative, which was an initiative that covered eight states in the, the Appalachian Midwest sort of area of the country, those judicial leaders in those, those eight states were looking at a way to provide training and to provide expert training to judges within those states in a way that was cost-effective, accessible, um, and that would increase that pro professional interaction between colleagues with similar interests and concerns. So, you know, doing this innovative collaboration building between the medical community and the judicial community, and also developing a a mechanism that would also at the same time increase access for rural stakeholders, which we heard was often a barrier to um, to attend judicial training, judicial education, whether in state or out state, um, that really was identified as a barrier. The leadership of the RJOY identified, there we go, um, six key topics that we were going that that were going to be used across our joy, um, regardless of state, and, and really just, we were looking to create as much structure as we could so that in partnering with the treatment agencies, medical schools, which whatever was appropriate in each state, we were able to come in and say, these are the sessions that we want to have um, uniform across those our joy states. These are the topics. We identified some goals that go a little bit deeper than what you see here. But as you can see, it really was meant to be um, foundation setting so that judicial participants would be able to have an understanding of and be able to describe medications used to treat opi opioid use disorder as part of a treatment curriculum, but also help the judicial participants create a working knowledge of what they, of, of things they needed to know and able to help inform decisions. So it was it was a lot of discussion and a lot of work with our medical experts and the RJOY leaders to understand what is it about these these particular topics, um, screening and assessment or the American with Disabilities Act. Um, what is it about these topics that judges should know and need to know to be able to help inform their decision making at release and sentencing? So this this series here, this six series session, six session series here um, is the first set of, of ECHO series that were done across those eight states. And then there was a second set um, based on feedback of judicial participants and medical participants and, and those of us who were um, working with each of the states. We made some changes for the second set of pilots. And so you see now we went from six sessions to seven and we added in that first session an an introductory overview about brain chemistry and why substance use disorder knowledge and opioid use disorder knowledge is important to judicial officers. It also served as an opportunity for us to introduce judges to this format of 20 minutes of a didactic, 20 minutes of um, question and answer, and 20 minutes of case-based learning so that we could get through some of those initial um, sort of get to know me things that you go through when you start a training. So talking, testing audio and visual capacity, um, setting expectations around attendance, introducing judicial participants to the hub team, to the medical experts and to the judicial champion, um, and really working through some of those things, asking, you know, setting the expectation of case-based learning. So taking advantage of that first session to really do a lot of that work so that when we hit the ground running for session two, we were ready to go um, and we could got some of those introductory pieces done. Um, so six states did this second series as their, their second round of pilots. Michigan, for example, their leader, our joy leadership and judicial experts and, and medical experts decided that they really didn't want to do another SUD, OUD session, and they catered it to what was a, a need of their judicial community at the time, which was to focus on treatment courts and to focus on 
um, judges who recently took over a treatment court, court docket or who were soon to be anticipating um, taking over a treatment court docket and developed eight sessions focused on how to shift judicial practices from traditional court, if you will, to um, what a judicial role would look like in treatment court. So that is how Michigan did their second series. As part of all of the, the pilot projects that our joy did, there were a few pilots as part of this judicial opioid initiative. Um, we partnered with a, an action researcher to conduct evaluation of the project echo for the judiciary series. And we were able to do, um, we did a pre training pre echo survey and a post echo survey. And we were able to do that for each of the pilot projects that was ex that were executed across those eight states. And as you can see here on the slide, we had over a uh, hundred judges participate across those states. Um, a hundred percent of responding judges would likely engage in another project echo series, which is amazing. I think that we all would be um, challenged to think of a training where everyone said, I would love to do that again. Um, and 98% of those responding judges identified solutions to local challenges driven by substance use disorder through the echo sessions. And again, um, this last piece and is, you know, the evaluator did identify multiple statistically significant outcomes um, in, in training appreciably shifting knowledge and, and, and or the attitudes of participating judges. And you're gonna see some more of those um, those outcome slides as we continue on with our, our time with you together this afternoon. So it, it as I said, you know, the evaluation piece is a big piece because we want to make sure that what we're doing is impactful and that we're able to achieve the goals that we originally set out to do. So we're going to talk more about that as we go on. And with that, um, one last slide on the, the training piece here. So here you can see from across um, the project echo for the judiciary states looking at pre-test and post-test respondents you can see the numbers across from illinois to west virginia they're in alphabetical order 76 judges completed pre-training survey and 54 of them completed the post-training survey so you can just see the numbers there it was small um we we didn't intend for these echo series to be um largely attended we wanted to keep it to a manageable group um, of judicial attendees so that we could focus on being attentive to their specific learning and questions and needs. And so we really kept it, kept it small. Um, and we'll talk more about that again, too, as we get on further in our presentation today. And with that, I want to shift it over. So we've talked about the hub team, right? We talked about um, medical experts being on the hub team and then the judicial expert on the hub team. So I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Troxler, who's going to talk about her perspective as the physician member on the hub team in Tennessee. Thank you, Shelley. First off, um, can you guys see me or hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Okay, good. So I'm having a not atypical echo experience where technology, what I started with, failed me. Um, because my internet connection for my computer, for whatever reason, isn't great, but the connection on my phone is better. So I started off working with Echo as a participant. Um, so I would join Echo, just as you guys have logged in for this Zoom session, to listen to didactic, to listen to people present cases, and um, just learn from a group of people who really loved what they were doing. Um, so it would often be that I would be on my phone or someone else would be on their phone. There was one participant. Um, I had a much, but I could have identified her from her nose um, because she was always walking around with her phone. So I saw the underside of her nose more than I ever saw her face. Um, so that's one of the things about Echo is it's meant to be incredibly accessible to many different people from many different backgrounds. Um, when we put this together for the judiciary, it was very much focused on the judges. Part of what we took away from this was how to incorporate and use this platform to bring in more people who are connected to what happens within the courtroom, whether that is the liaison for 
the prison system to the court or DCS workers or the probation officer. And we actually ended up having a spinoff of the ECHO we did here in Tennessee, where we connected with case managers, supervisors for the DCS within the state of Tennessee. So we had, I think, about 12 members across the state representing their different territories who joined us um, so that we could kind of spread the knowledge that we had started with the judiciary and recognizing so much of what they were seeing in their courts related to substance use disorder and the individuals that they had on their docket we usually often had a family piece or maybe the judges we were some of the ones that we worked with actually were judges that were part of family courts so there was a lot of dcs type things that were coming in front of them and they were trying to get a better understanding of the family members attached to these children whose lives they were deciding why they were not able to comply with its pretty simple list of requirements we have that we need you to do what's happening why are things falling through the cracks why are we not able to get a negative drug screen why can i not return your children to you yet because you haven't done the things that i've asked of you so the echo um model was a way for us to connect with initially the judges um increase their understanding of what substance use disorder is how we treat it what we treat it with and why we see the difficulties that we see within this population, um, different things that influence that from genetics to trauma as children, to ongoing trauma as adults, all the ins and outs of what it is to take care of individuals who have substance use disorder. Because one thing we all came to the table with was an understanding of we're all trying in our different disciplines, how to help people live the life trying to live. So from the bench, trying to put things forth that enabled families to come back together, that enabled people to get better and reunify, that kept children safe, knew that you were returning them to a safe home, or how do we stop the recidivism? I keep seeing the same people coming up over and over and over on my docket. And then also importantly, for the medical side, how do we engage with the court system? How do we do it in a respectful manner? How do we share some of the same language? Because we certainly share some of the same people um, and that ability to understand one another's perspectives and that we have that shared goal of improving the safety and quality and experience that our community members have um, by creating intact families, by maintaining intact families, by having people who are able to not be on the inside, who are out working and being productive members of our society and getting their conditions properly and appropriately treated. Um, and so when I started as a participant and was able to get an idea of how the model worked, where cases would be presented, there would be a learning opportunity, more than anything, that opportunity to talk and share and discuss um, what we're seeing, what we're experiencing, and how to take that back to my own patients and apply what I'd learned from ECHO. So the same thing with um, the judges what were they able to take back to their courtrooms and apply to what they were seeing um, and help move that forward. So when you are a panelist, you feel connected, um, which was a really great thing during the pandemic, having Echo, because none of us felt connected. But even before that, when I first started, as you guys heard in the bio piece, um, I was in rural New Mexico, and New Mexico is the birthplace of Echo. So knowing that I had that resource, and there are probably physicians in New Mexico who've never participated in ECHO. Um, but there is a large number of physicians and other providers in New Mexico that have used ECHO. There's a ton of different medical ECHOs, but they've realized the utility of this model for many different settings, including the public school system in Albuquerque. Um, and then for this, where we are using it with judges, but there's also that medical interface. Um, so, being in that panel group and recognizing that I had other people I could lean on, other people who had similar experiences to me, it connected me outside of that one hour, two hours I spent um, on a Zoom meeting with people from around the country. The ECHO I participated in had participants all the way from Northeast to Southern California and everything in between. Um, sometimes it's regional, like ours, all of our participants for this um, judicial panel were judges within the state of Tennessee and then DCS workers within the state of Tennessee. Um, so with that being said, I transitioned into a new 
job where I got to launch an echo and what it was like to be a facilitator on that side and making certain that we created a sense of community and realizing how important that was to make echo feel a welcoming space. All questions were honored and respected. And then being able to take that and move it into a non-medical environment where we were working to connect with judges. Um, and so when we did that, what we were trying to present to them was information they could lean on to help them make informed decisions or guidance from the bench um, for what to do with the individuals and the families that were in front of them. And because I'm on my phone and I don't have control of my slides, if I could have the next slide, please. And luckily, I have the slides in front of me so I can actually see what's on them because on my phone, if anybody else is on your phone, you can't see that very well. Um, so what we were looking at on this, um, with this first figure that I get to talk about is it being considered a disability under the Americans with Disabilities Act. So we're speaking to individuals who know the law inside and out much better than I will ever know it. Um, but we got to present information about ADA and the protections of ADA on individuals who have a diagnosis of substance use disorder, because this is a condition that is protected by the ADA. Um, so we had a lawyer, may have been a judge as well, but he definitely went inside it out and he presented to our judges on this. And you can see um, the changes that we had from pre to post that this is definitely now recognized, but those who participated in our ECHO, um, that they, the majority agree and recognize that this is a condition that's protected by the ADA. Um, and this is important because when it comes to um, whether we can or cannot keep our patients on medication approved, FDA approved for treatment of substance use disorder, this is important to recognize that it is a protected medical condition and therefore the medications that we use to treat patients with opioid use disorder are also protected. Um, I was able to discuss in my past life with a, um, a large mining company that had taken buprenorphine on the no-no list as far as medications that their employees were allowed to be on, I was able to get um, exempt status for one of my patients because without his medication and as protected by ADA, he had a right to be on medication to treat his condition. Um, he got to keep his job, which meant he got to keep the house he had just bought and he got to keep his truck and all the things that everybody needs to be productive um, and take care of their family and keep roofs over heads and food and bellies. Um, next slide, please. And this one, hmm, mine are in a different order than this. Hold on. So this one, familiarity with opioid use disorder screening tools. Um, we increased um, this one significantly as well. As you can see, all the little red circles and the little star asterisk by their difference is statistically significant. Um, so we were able to move people's familiarity from not so familiar to not at all familiar to moderately very familiar and extremely familiar. So introducing things like the DSM-5 criteria for having a substance use disorder, what that looks like, different ways of assessing um, individuals for do they have an issue with substance use disorder, whether it be CAGE questionnaires or DAST or audit. Um, there are a lot of different types of questionnaires out there that help um, kind of hone in on whether individuals are experiencing difficulty with substance use disorder. So knowing that those exist and how to use them um, was something we were able to successfully increase familiarity with, with our judicial panel. Next slide. And then familiarity with the medications themselves. Um, this, was, this was a big one. A lot of people knew about buprenorphine on the panel, but it was more about knowing about it and what they knew about it was different. So they knew buprenorphine was medication we used, but their familiarity with the medication itself and how it worked was not, they were not as familiar with the medication and how it was used. Methadone, people had heard of, um, and then the naltrexone, the different ways in which we use the medications, which I'm getting ahead of myself. I think that's my next slide. Um, all the different medications, how we use them, and in what ways they are beneficial to 
the individuals that we are working with who have opioid use disorder um, specifically, which was our focus was opioid use disorder. We did include in our um, sessions with the judges because it comes up. We're all seeing a huge surge in stimulant use disorder, the use of stimulants, the presence of stimulants. Um, so whether it's methamphetamine, which is what we're most commonly in encountering, or um, cocaine. So if you will go ahead and give me the next slide, please. This is the one that I found um, very interesting because this is the um, perceptions of effectiveness for the different medications that we use for opioid use disorder. So people have heard about, and you can see kind of top line, bottom line, pre-test, post-test for the different medications and the different ways in which we administer them. So very many people had heard about methadone, they knew about it, but we did move the line in a statistically significant fashion that um, methadone was effective. Um, it was very common what we encountered for there to be a negative association with any of the opioid medications that we use to treat opioid use disorder, um, sometimes seen as we're, we're just substituting one opioid for a different opioid and trying to move that dial on why this is different, um, how this is changing behaviors through pharmaceuticals that are prescribed and picked up through a pharmacy or from a dispensing window at a methadone maintenance clinic or um, that they're taken appropriately and not overused, um, not diverted, how these medications are actually effective in the treating of opioid use disorder even though they are opioids themselves, they play a major role in helping patients to stabilize their opioid use disorder. So we did move the dial on methadone, even though there was a large number of people who were aware of it and its effectiveness. Then oral buprenorphine and injectable buprenorphine. Um, probably the place I think we made some of the largest impact was increasing how very effectively um, injectable buprenorphine was received um, by participants, but also how effective the oral buprenorphine so the sublingual administration of buprenorphine is, um, in particular in the northeast portion of Tennessee and then there are pockets all throughout the United States, but I'm lucky enough um, to live in a place where buprenorphine has a pretty bad app um, because there are a lot of people who are using it in ways in which we wish they didn't. Um, that There are clinics that are administering prescriptions um, or the medication itself in ways that those of us who really love being evidence-based and following in guidelines um, wish that everybody would get on board with that and um, do it in the way in which that feels more like we're providing medical care and not just prescriptions um, to run around on the streets. So we were able to be impactful with that, with the education that we provided to the judges and help move the dial on recognizing when used appropriately, these medications um, are very effective. The injectable buprenorphine, especially, um, in a population that might be in a controlled setting, such as a jail or a prison, um, the utility of utilizing that medication in that setting is great. Uh, there were a lot of individuals that were aware of the injectable naltrexone, and we did not change people's perceptions or knowledge about that very much. And one of the judges, the facilitator for our group, had let us know that that he and a number of other judges had actually been visited with some regularity um, by drug reps from um, the company that makes the injectable naltrexone. Has that, that is their best bet. That's the best thing to utilize in um, the incarcerated population if they were going to be treating or even if for outpatient treatment, that's the way that they should be going. So they were getting rather skewed information. And through ECHO, we were able to provide a balanced information about the use and utility of injectable naltrexone and why it is a good choice, but it's not the only choice. And truly the best choice is the medication that your parent, your patients are able to adhere to. Um, so we were able to move the dial quite effectively, I think on a number of the other medications and our judges understanding of the effectiveness and use and the importance of using something other than injectable naltrexone um, in the individuals that they saw presenting um, in front of them. And I think that now brings us to um, Judge Durkin, and I will let him take it from here. Thank you. Doctor, thank you so much. Um, I've had the privilege of serving as a judge in the Mahoney County Common Police Court since 1997. 
uh, and I've presided over a felony drug court for over 25 years. And I think sometimes it's important to take a look at where we were, um, which helps us, I think, shape and form where we're going and where we are today. So, so many things have changed, both as it relates to uh, substance use disorder and education. When I took the bench 25 years ago, uh, it's funny, the drug of choice was cocaine and crack. Uh, our average participant was 35 years old. Uh, fast forward, of course, we had the opioid epidemic. Uh, our participants age uh, on average dropped to about 22 or 23. And now of course, as Dr. Troxler just indicated, uh, we are seeing uh, a reemergence of stimulants. Uh, we called it addiction back then, not a substance use disorder, and we've certainly learned that words do matter. Recovery was abstinence-based. We certainly had methadone, uh, but no one called it medication for addiction treatment. In terms of education, uh, most if not all disciplines certainly require continuing education. Uh, the method of providing this education has certainly changed over time. Uh, 25 years ago, webinars were in their infancy. Uh, mandatory education and seminars were traditionally held in a ballroom of a hotel where large tables were set up and one speaker talked primarily at you uh, with no active dialogue or question and answer. I think Zoom was introduced about 10 years ago. Um, and as it relates to judicial education, from my perspective, there's certainly mandatory education. And in Ohio, it's not even called education now, it's called New Judges School. It's not a one day seminar. So it's comprehensive and it's often challenging to balance the required education uh, with attempting to manage your new docket. But unfortunately, in Ohio at least, there's little or no education for new judges as it relates to substance use disorder or treatment um, because there's no time to fit it into the curriculum. Uh, there's simply too much else to cover. So how can a judge obtain the education necessary, especially a new judge, uh, so that decisions can be based on evidence-based practice and hopefully receive and obtain better outcomes at the end. So Shelley and Dr. Trocher talked about um, our joy, and it actually started with the eight state members back in 2006. And from a judicial perspective, the training uh, is different. It's more interactive than anything you will ever attend. That's primarily due to a smaller number of participants um, and the case studies that I'll talk about in a little greater detail in a bit uh, promote this active dialogue and discussion. It's set up and it's fast paced. So typically it's done in one hour segments. Um, in Ohio, we have done it over lunch. So we do it from 12 o'clock to one o'clock. And the benefit of course in that is that you don't have to rearrange your docket or schedule. You don't have to travel. It's very easy to accommodate. Uh, this has already been mentioned, but it can't be overstated. Judges are learning from leading experts in the field on topics that will directly impact and enhance a judge's decision-making on cases that involve substance use disorder. The challenge can sometimes be convincing a judge that recommendations from a doctor or from an expert do not take away their judicial discretion. Uh, believe it or not, sometimes judges don't want to be told what to do or how to do it. So the education will hopefully allow judges to both stay in their lanes, recognizing what they know and more importantly, what they don't, but ultimately increase options at sentencing, violation hearings, or whether you preside over a drug or treatment court. And 
speaking of that, you don't have to run a drug court or a treatment court to participate and benefit from this program. There are over 3,800 treatment courts in the United States. And in my opinion, Project ECHO is designed for jurisdictions or courts that don't have a drug or treatment court. The target population when we first started this program uh, with the National Center for State Courts and the Supreme Court of Ohio were identifying judges who had little or no background or experience with this population. So we identify those judges who are new to the bench, uh, potentially who have sat for less than five years, and it's exactly what Project ECHO is designed for. The information and education that hopefully generates questions and potentially changes philosophy and practice. Um, so if you're in a court and you've got a prosecutor, if you've got a probation officer uh, who are leaning toward violating somebody uh, for testing uh, positive on a screen, uh, the information and education that a judge can obtain through Project ECHO can hopefully and ultimately change the philosophy and direction of how uh, offenders are treated in the program or in your court. Of course, this model um, builds relationships. So it's not limited at all to the actual education during the six or seven uh, sessions that are held through Project ECHO, but relationships are being established that can be long-term and benefit both physicians, uh, the judge, and your team. The case studies that I mentioned earlier are tremendously important and valuable. Uh, typically, they involve an actual case that's pending or recently disposed of. And to date, I've been involved in four Project ECHOs, two with the National Center for State Courts and two through the uh, Supreme Court of Ohio and the Ohio Judicial College, and we're planning a fifth. And I've absolutely learned something from each session. So take a look at some of the additional outcomes from the project. Uh, you can see that respondents generally agreed pre-training that recovery is possible after substance use relapse. 75% strongly agreed, but they were significantly more likely to strongly agree with the statement following the training, 92%. And uh, the implications of this can't be overstated. Uh, I mentioned a little bit earlier about changing philosophy, but I know from experience, both as a defense attorney before taking the bench and listening to some of the, uh, some of my fellow judges, that when you have a participant, a participant, an offender, a defendant, however you want to classify them, uh, who has a positive screen, uh, there are too, too many cases where a probation officer, a prosecutor, or even a judge decides that uh, they don't have another chance and they're either sent to jail or prison because of that positive screen. The education provided through this, that relapse, um, that recovery is possible after substance use relapse can absolutely change not only outcomes, but an individual's life as it relates to how we address them. Most judges agreed before and after the training uh, that opioid use disorder should be a goal of the justice system and several responses shifted to strongly agree following 76% to 85%. Um, much of the sentencing guidelines and principles is set forth in Ohio by statute. And the primary goals are to protect the public and punish the defendant. Um, I think the legislature has fallen short as it relates to the need to add uh, opioid use disorder and treatment as a goal in the justice system, because ultimately it does impact both uh, protecting the public uh, and punishing an offender by providing 
certainly treatment to address a substance use disorder. Most felt the need to increase funding toward opioid use disorder services in the justice system, both pre and post training. Uh, this should not be a surprise. Um, it's not a statistically significant uh, difference in terms of pre and post training, uh, but again, evidence that judges following the training recognize that services should be enhanced. Both before and after training, most participants strongly or somewhat agreed they should rely on the advice of treatment experts to develop mandates for an individual's MOUD treatment regimen. 91% uh, somewhat or strongly agreed and 94% following. This one surprised me a little bit based upon what I mentioned a little bit earlier. Uh, there are judges, especially those who are not familiar with substance use disorder, relapse and treatment who don't necessarily believe they should rely on experts or may be reluctant to, uh, this was encouraging to me. Over, although overall there was not a statistically significant change following the training, more participants believe that MOUD treatment should not be discontinued upon completion of a core program. Um, this one hits home to me. Uh, someone said a long time ago that if you're doing something today the same as when you started, you're doing something wrong. So I mentioned very early that when I started the drug court, um, it was abstinence-based and when the opioid use epidemic or the opioid epidemic hit, um, I was reluctant. In fact, it's stronger than that. I would not allow medication for addiction treatment as part of the program. And a friend of mine who was board certified in addiction medicine uh, called me out and said, you have no idea what you're doing. And uh, he was right, of course, and I was wrong. But I came up with a very ridiculous policy in the program, and that was that someone needed to be off of the medication for addiction treatment in order to graduate. And that same friend, a short time later, uh, convinced me once again that I was, quite frankly, an idiot, um, that I needed to rely on the experts. And of course, um, I changed that policy and philosophy. So. Uh, Education does work, and I guess one example of a judge who can demonstrate that maybe uh, they need to stay in their lane. And of course, um, both before and after Project ECHO training, trainees primarily strongly agreed that judges should encourage participants of MOUD treatment programs to also take part in supportive wraparound services. Um, and that was 82% pretest and 91% post test. Thank you so much, Judge Durkin, for your your words and your your sharing your experience and in, in being involved in so many echoes and, and seeing um, how the pilots have progressed to institutionalization there in Ohio. Um, our, our next step is, is another video. And so our um, partners at the University of West Virginia put together a video highlighting their, highlighting our partnership and their success with ECHO, uh, the, with Project ECHO for the judiciary in their state. And so we're gonna share that video with you real quick. And then we're gonna have a couple more slides and follow up with Q&A. So Andrew, if you wanna go ahead and start that video.
one of the things that the medical field has really been criticized for is not taking into consideration um, the systems in which our patients live and the systems that they interact with. And so I know from patients that I work with that sometimes their probation officer or even the judge they're working with will tell them one thing uh, and we will tell them another thing. And that's extremely confusing. We just need to be thinking uh, not just what's appropriate for the, uh, the criminal justice system, but what's good for public health uh, and public safety, uh, with all with the idea that the vast, vast majority of offenders coming before the court will ultimately reside in our community. And we got to figure out how to make it work. This Judiciary Echo really was an outstanding experience. It just makes complete sense for us to work together. Individuals are complex, they have complex needs, they interact with different segments of the community, and, and working together we can do much better for individuals that are suffering than in our silos. Uh, it also gave us the opportunity to really share with one another what we do. So what, for example, what is medication assisted treatment look like, what it should look like, uh, was one of the things we talked with uh, the judges about, as well as prescribing practices for both medications for substance use disorders, as well as uh, for co-occurring psychiatric disorders. This collaboration has changed my approach to working with people with substance use disorders. For example, given the brain science of addiction, I am no longer as perplexed and frustrated when a treatment court participant relapses, particularly early in the treatment. I understand now that until a brain has time to heal, relapse may happen. I would absolutely do so. I would absolutely do so. I would definitely continue this collaboration in the future and recommend it to my colleagues without reservation. Would I, con would I continue the collaboration and would I recommend my colleagues do so? Uh, yes and yes. So a lot of that feedback um, from the video, you know, reinforces what Judge Durkin had had spoke about and what Dr. Troxler had talked about. And I think one of the things that we haven't mentioned yet is that um, sort of the opposite effect is anticipated. Like we expected in designing the Project Echo for the judiciary, like that that the judges would take away, you know, certain pieces of of information and knowledge around substance use disorders and co-occurring disorders and medication and things. But another thing that happened is we also saw the treatment community benefiting in a different way in that we had a number of treatment providers, whether it be in Tennessee or, or uh, West Virginia um, or, or other states, you know, going to court and going to observe, you know, a criminal docket, going to, to have follow-up meetings with the judges so that the treatment providers and the, the doctors and and everyone who was on the hub team, you know, could have a greater understanding of what's happening in court and what, um, you know, how judges are receiving cases and how much time judges have to spend with cases and how much information judges are hearing and absorbing in such a condensed period of time to be able to, to manage um, and to make decisions around 
um, defendants, offenders, you know, next steps, probation violations, things like that. So I just wanted to make sure to mention that piece as well, because it was a certainly an unintended outcome of Project ECHO for the judiciary. And I think that, you know, as we, we heard from Judge Durkin and Dr. Troxler and from our partners um, from West Virginia, you know, there the the collaboration is is far more robust than than anticipated and really is you know we've we've been successful in in creating some some um you know some relationships and some and creating linkages for those those often siloed systems to be able to talk and to learn from each other our next couple slides to to close us out are um, a listing of the echo partnerships that we established um, in each of the state that we've had pilots in. So we talked a lot about our joy in the Mid-Appalachian and Midwestern states. There's also a, a regional judicial opioid um, initiative in New England. And so you see those states listed here as well. So, so far we've completed um, at least one ECHO series, if not two in these states listed here. Um, and then we'll go to the next slide here to list the, the current uh, opportunity, the current ECHO series that are going on. We have two more planned in New England for 2020, late this year, early 2023. Um, but it really is, I think, you know, speaking selfishly um, as, as one who gets to coordinate and work with the judges and work with the, the uh, medical experts, it really has been a really fulfilling part of the work that I do in being able to connect these two typically siloed entities um, and to see the needle get moved and to see the learning take place and to see the the model you know actuated and to see you know the the aha moments if you will and to add to what judge Durkin said about you know the small you know round table setup of the the echo series you know it really does create an environment where you know, judges, judicial attendees can ask questions and we can work head on to dispel myths and some perhaps inaccurate information or information that's changed over time. You know, we we went from, you know, we talked about stigma and language and, and you know, how, you know, terms and, and, and things have changed over time. And so we've talked about, um, you know, addressing those those head on and working to help educate the judiciary about those changes that have taken place in the medical community. And, and as I said, create a safe space to talk about um, challenges and myths and successes. Um, so these last couple of slides are really, you know, sort of um, taking that momentum we were talking about, about all the good outcomes and talking about how, how one can, can work to start a project echo for the judiciary series in your state, obviously gain support you know, the support of your stakeholders, whether it be the judiciary or probation, if that's a world um, where you would like to, to think about taking this model, um, but gain support, talk with your, your echo hubs um, in, you know, the, in those uh, organizations that are already having an echo, doing a, an echo series on this topic in your state. <clears throat> really easy to not reinvent the wheel for those those agencies that are already doing an echo. Um, attend University of New Mexico Project Echo training. Um, Pre-COVID, it was in person and now it's virtual and um, a day or so of, of learning about the model, the history and things like that. Um, build a partnership with, as I said previously, your local university healthcare provider. Um, and then bring the state court and the medical community together, bring that judicial champion and someone from that local university or provider together to start having the conversation of what are your goals? What are the topics? What are, you know, things that each, each entity is seeing as um, a pinch point if you don't already have a topic identified, but it really is a, a, a piece of it, it the echo series starting out could be starting it out and building these collaborations can seem a little overwhelming but you, everyone really is coming from the same place with the same intent which is to be able to have the best information possible and to have um, a mechanism for sharing information and to be able to best um, impact your communities and that's ultimately what this is is, is treatment providers and schools and 
treatment organizations and, and the judiciary and the state courts coming together to help build stronger and, and, and help your communities. So with that, I will I will end our our webinar, the, the speaking part of our webinar. My contact information is there. Please do um, don't hesitate to reach out with any questions. And with that, I'll give the floor back to Melissa. Thank you. And thank you to all of our presenters for sharing your information and, and your experiences. Um, we do have some time for questions. So for those of you uh, who have already entered some questions in the Q&A box, thank you. However, uh, please do click on that Q&A icon at the bottom of the screen and enter your questions there if you have something else to ask our presenters. And so we'll just dive in. Okay. So um, just first, a couple more um, kind of introductory items. So we will notify everyone who's registered for this webinar. You will get a notification when the slides are ready. So we'll send a link to you directly with the slides. We'll also send you a notification when the recording is available on SAMHSA's YouTube. So uh, just stay tuned for that. Okay. So looking at our questions, we have one person who said our state echoes have been utilized for the COVID pandemic. The process has tapped the resource providing the support for the echo. Are there suggestions, suggestions to bridge the way echo has been used and branching them out into something like this for additional agency training? So I guess my sense is uh, the resource has been utilized heavily for COVID. Um, however, there's still interest in seeing, you know, how can we stretch it out even further to address substance use education. So um, any suggestions? I'd like to start with Michelle. Do you have any suggestions for this speaker? And then I'd also like to touch uh, base with uh, Dr. Trackler and Judge Durkin on this question. Sure, absolutely. I think, you know, it, depending on, you know, you said state echo, so I'm not sure, you know, if, if it's a if there are other opportunity, other organizations out there that would be interested in getting in, um, you know, and getting trained in the ECHO model to be able to, um, you know, go through that training and to be able to start hosting and, and being um, a leader of ECHOs in your community, that's one opportunity. Um, another would be to reach out to a like organization in, in a neighboring state and see if they've um, experienced that same fatigue and if they've had, um, you know, any similar you know, experiences and trying to navigate that, um, you know, it could be as simple sometimes as bringing on new staff or diversifying existing staff. Um, you know, there really is no, no easy answer, I don't think, um, short of, of managing that resource issue and trying to figure out a way to expand the reach. Um, Dr. Troxler and, and Judge Durkin, I'm sure you may have something to add to that having, you know, been in Dr. Troxler, particularly in the treatment world. So one thought is, it, it sounds like there's already a vehicle there that utilizes ECHO and how, how, who are the people who kind of run that? Who are the ones who are making decisions about what the content is or isn't going to be? Um, getting to know them a little bit and seeing if there's some wiggle room to add to or spin off because maybe we're all a little tired of COVID and we want to do something else with ECHO or um, resources. Really, to run an ECHO, um, you, there, you don't need much. Seriously, if everybody has a smartphone, you can do it. Um, it's a matter of resources like how is your time allotted? So if you feel so moved and you want to launch an ECHO, just start inviting your friends to get together and then word of mouth. Like You can attend the free training. Um, the immersion training out of UNM, and literally there are third world countries who are running Echoes using smartphones. Um, so you you don't need a ton of infrastructure to launch an Echo. Um, the only thing to actually call it Echo is attending that immersion training, and then you basically present them with your idea, tell them what you want to do. They may or may not assign you a liaison. Um, when we first did this, we did have a liaison through Echo, someone who just kind of helped us walk through what it was like to launch it, make certain we were staying in keeping with the model of how it's set up between um, making certain that it's a very equitable, safe space for people to share information. But seriously, it's it's time. Sometimes there's a little bit of money. Um, you may even be able to get a grant through your community, um, some entity, a private grant, something within the institution that you're in. Uh, but really what you need the most of to launch a new ECHO is a desire. 
and from there you you can make it happen. Um, you can start small and build it. The echo that I currently still facilitate and have been for three years is um, I'll just go ahead and give it a plug. It's called I Am Echo, and it stands for Interdisciplinary Addiction Medicine Echo. Um, and you can just Google it, ETSU I Am Echo, if you want to check us out. Um, shameless plug, but um, you you just you find a group of people. People um, that are interested in hearing what you have to share, who want to share something to, and then you just start spreading it by word of mouth. You may even get like an email list of um, of individuals who are attending Echoes already in your state and see if the people who run those are interested in sharing those listservs or sending information out to those people. Would you be interested in? One of the things we did in the beginning was a needs assessment. What do you want to hear about from us? We're going to talk about addiction. I think we may have lost Dr. Chuck where um, she is in a rural area uh, or near a rural area of Tennessee, so it's possible that she lost the connection there. Um, Judge Durkin, I did want to turn it to you if you had any other comments that you wanted to add to, to what uh, Ms. Cern and Dr. Chuck will have already shared. The only thing I could add from a judicial perspective is we have the benefit of a very strong uh, education platform for this through the Supreme Court of Ohio, uh, and it's called the Ohio Judicial College. So our first two project echoes were done, as I mentioned, with the National Center for State Courts. But there was such a recognition in the state that this could benefit so many more judges that the transition was very, very smooth to the educational branch that services judges in Ohio. And we've now done two project echoes through the Ohio Judicial College. And as I indicated, are planning a third. So it is easily replicated. Um, it does not take a lot. And as we were going through it, I was I, I saw one chat as it relates to Project Echo um, in other or with other key stakeholders, uh, whether that's probation, whether that's the prosecutors association, public defenders. Uh, uh, in jails, sheriffs. Uh, so reach out and I would agree with both Shelley and Dr. Troxler. Uh, if there's a desire, there's an absolute easy way to do it. Dr. Troxler, we, lo we lost you when you were on the tail end of, of what you were ending with. So I just wanted to give you a chance to end your thought to, to close this out. I was pretty much done. So thank you, Judge Director for picking up. Apparently, I'm in the Bermuda Triangle. I thought I was in East Tennessee. I'm in the Bermuda Triangle. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so uh, we, uh, here's a question that I would like to start with uh, Judge Durkin on. Um, so someone said our treatment court in rural Montana began in 2021. And so I think Dr. Stockford also probably can speak to this. Um, we just recently had our first graduation. Our treatment court is also abstinence based. So I'm sure that sounds familiar to you, Judge Durkin. Um, how can I get our judges to change their opinion and or participate in the ECHO program? And uh, um, she, she had some opinions about the judges in her state. But um, so Judge Durkin, you know, what would you suggest to her in terms of um, helping educate or move judges along in, in terms of embracing uh, medication for opioid use disorder and, and the ECHO model? So, uh... It sounds all too familiar going back to when I started and there were many, many critics of the program as it relates to how we dealt with the offenders um, from law enforcement to prosecutors. Uh, it was challenging getting a buy-in from public defenders or defense attorneys, uh, let alone uh, fellow judges. I, I will say that not every judge is cut out to run a drug court or a treatment court. It takes a very special person. And as long as I've been doing this, there are still a few on my bench that don't necessarily buy in. And that's okay, you'll never get everyone. But I think the more you do it, uh, the results will speak for themselves. And if you provide the education, they may or may not attend the program. Uh, I can tell you 
eventually um, the outcomes will speak for themselves. And I guarantee you that you will begin to have law enforcement start referring people to your program. You will have prosecutors buy in. Uh, I would invite your fellow judges to a graduation if they didn't attend the first and they may attend the second or the third. And with time, I know that uh, you will become institutionalized to the point where it's gonna be hard to uh, say anything other than this works and recovery works. So I would just stay at it. That's uh, Dr. Traxler, from your perspective, working in rural areas, working with judges through the ECHO project, um, any suggestions you would have in terms of helping um, uh, move judges in their opinions or embracing educational programs like ECHO? Um, I think it's a lot of patient persistence. Um, keep showing up, keep having a positive attitude, let them know that Okay, I'm going to give her a minute to come back. Um, so, uh, Michelle, I, I would, or Shelley, I would like to end with you on that question if you have some additional comments to add. Well, I think where Dr. Troxler was going to go was, you know, to, okay. you know, constant reinforcement, right? Con you know, constantly offer treatment and access and, you know, to visit other courts or to, um, you know, learn from another judge. I think sometimes it's, you know, one of the, the approaches I've used is to try to link up a judge um, that you're trying to move just a little bit, um, you know, with a, with a colleague who's already, who maybe came from that same place and has now moved um, a little bit more towards accepting, but yeah, patience, patience, patience. It's hard. It's hard to move some of those, those practices and those, those, um, those philosophies. Um, so I, I, I empathize with you and, and that challenge. Dr. Traxler, um, Michelle just, uh, Shelly picked up and, and was just talking about giving things time, patient, using patience. And so I, I think she thinks that that's where you were going in your comment, but please. Yes. Like so just that, that patient persistence where you just continue to show up, attend meetings, try and find time um, with individuals that you are attempting to influence because it is that continuing to show up, showing that you're, you're serious about what you're talking about. You what you're talking about and that truthfully you have some answers to the problems that they're experiencing because it's one thing to go and just complain nobody has time for that but if you go and you have potential solutions or you want to share with them something that you're excited about um just up and you're gonna find someone who's a little more receptive you're gonna be able to um if you're if you're going to be able to make a difference with just even a couple of people, it's going to spread. It is going to increase. And eventually, just as Judge, Judge Durkin was saying, there are going to be those that you aren't going to get to. Um, but time will take care of that as well. Um, people move into different roles, different positions, different jobs. People retire. Um, but that patient persistence that you continue to engage in. And then also being in a situation where you're able to teach those who want to be taught, um, like where we're here in the fellowship and we're sending individuals out into the court systems. They're working in one of the judicial systems that we have here. So we have our physician fellows in the community learning, um, just soaking up as much as they can. So any way that you can reach out and connect with, you never know when it's going to pay dividends, um, somebody being ready to hear what it is you have to offer. Here recently in our community, um, one of the county um, sheriffs has shared that he's um, He's ready for something else other than the naltrexone only answers that they get from one of the entities that's actually contracted with the court. Um, he knows that he needs something more than that. That's a new turn. That's a change from when I first started working in this community. Um, it takes time and make friends with your county commissioners. Um, make friends in places that you didn't even think you needed to have friends. Thank you for that. All right. So we're, um, 
getting close to the end of our Q and A. Um, someone did add a comment, and I just wanted to briefly touch on it with all three of you um, about drug testing. And and so this comment's encouraging us to think beyond drug testing as a measure of recovery. And uh, so you know, better measures could include you know whether a person's social determinants of health are improving. Um, so you know, is the echo for the judiciary? Um, promoting other measures to, uh, you know, track that person's recovery besides drug testing. And, um, you know, what does education around that issue look like? And I'll start with Michelle and then, and then touch with our other presenters. Thanks, Melissa. And actually, I hate to do this to you, but I'd rather jump to Dr. Troxler instead. I know she's got technical difficulties, but I think she has a, a an easy, I think she's going to be more important to hear from than me. Okay. Sorry. So I agree 100% with that statement. Urine drug screens are a way to know whether somebody used a substance within the last few days. That's all it tells you. Um, constantly, I reinforce with my patients the story that they tell me is the story I see them living, and not what happens in the peak or the oral swab or whatever way that we measure their toxicology. Um, it is kind of a heads up to me if I am seeing that. It's something that we need to talk about. So. When we did the echo, actually, um, the one that I was in, I because I something I feel very strongly about, um, it's not just what happens in the peacock that our patients are experiencing. Um, so helping people understand what that urine actually means and is telling us and what we need to be paying attention to. Um, so even though I know we've been talking about like how do we get people to engage in this education, how do we get them to, to hear what it is that we're trying to share about how treatment works, what it's like to be in treatment, and why urine drug screens are not the end-all be-all. Um, however, you can get that information out there. The proof is in the pudding. You know, the patients, the clients, the, the people in front of the judge and working with the prosecutor and the DA, when they are, they keep court appointments. They follow through on the classes they're supposed to take. They're getting supervised visitation, whereas they had nothing or they've moved from supervised to unsupervised those are the places you can point to and say this person is doing what they need to do and i know what i saw on that urine but that is really not indicative of their recovery trajectory it's a conversation we need to have and it doesn't mean we need to dial back on what they're getting it may mean we need to dial up on their support but not get out the ruler and start smacking their wrist so um all i have to say again is just keep pushing forward with these positive messages these informed evidence-based, the literature is there to support us in this. Um, this is the way that we make a difference and turn the tide. Thank you. And I'd like to end with you, Judge Stirk, and any comments you want to add from your perspective as a judge on um, you know, measuring people's, uh, how people are doing in their recovery as they participate in drug courts. So we have not covered this specific topic with our Project ECHO, but it has given me an idea that we need to. Uh, but I agree completely with Dr. Troxler. Um, the benefit of having a drug court is that you have your entire team around you. So if you have someone with a positive screen, um, although it's important, I wanna know, are they showing up to work? Are they attending their individual counseling sessions? Are they uh, engaged with their family? And having the conversation with your team about how they're doing in life before and after is far more important than potentially a, a positive screen that you get. So um, you take a look at the entire person and how they're doing. And additionally, when that positive screen pops up, if it's very, very early in their recovery, obviously it's going to be different than if it happened six months or a year into their participation in the program. And there may be a different discussion and conversation that needs to take place. Thank you for that. So uh, just a, a warm thank you again to all of our presenters today for sharing your work in this model at Go for the Judiciary. And uh, we are gonna move on to our closing slides so that I can get everyone um, off the cameras and off the computer in time. So you should look in the chat and you should be seeing a certificate of attendance being dropped into the chat and you can click on that file and download it directly to your computer. And uh, so that certificate of attendance, once again, uh, for your personal use only, we're not able to offer CEU credit, 
but you can use it with some organizations. Some associations will allow you to use the certificate to get CEU credits. So um, that is for you to download directly. Next slide, please. Um, I also welcome you all to uh, join us in our next uh, presentation. And again, this is going to be looking at drug courts and treatment courts. So we are looking forward to hearing from three presenters talking about a trauma-informed approach um, for each treatment court uh, role. So everyone who has a role on a treatment court team has a, a way that they can um, incorporate trauma-informed practices and approaches. So we're going to do a deep dive into that in our next webinar on December 12th at 3.30 p.m. Eastern time. So please do uh, sign up for that when you see. We'll have registration links coming out to the SAMHSA listservs where you can sign up. So let's move over to the next slide. If you're not on the Gain Center listserv, here is an abbreviated URL. Just type this into your favorite browser and it will take you directly to the Gain Center website where you can sign up for our listserv. And that way you can get notifications of all of our upcoming webinars and other information that's disseminated um, from the Game Center. If you have any other questions that, uh, in particular, if your, your questions weren't answered today during the Q&A, um, Michelle shared, Shelley shared her contact information at the end of her presentation. There's also contact information for the Game Center at the bottom of this slide. So feel free to reach out to us if you had questions that weren't answered that you would really like to explore um, either with the Game Center or with our presenters and uh, we'll, we'll do what we can to get you linked up with the information you need. And so once again, if you haven't had a chance, the uh, webinar attendance certificate is in the chat. Just click on that and it will prompt you to download it to your computer. So we'll leave this window open for a few more moments for folks who need to download that attendance form. Um, so thank you all uh, for joining us today for this conversation and these presentations. And, um, and a final thank you to Judge Durkin, Michelle Stern, Stern and uh, Dr. Traxler for uh, your presentations and information. Look forward to seeing you all at the next Game Center webinar.